What we're really interested in is intelligence in brains and machines. If you're not familiar with this picture, this is the IBM supercomputer Watson that won the uh, achieved superhuman performance in a, in, a, in a TV game. And if you look at these two systems and how they deal with big data, it is very instructive to look at the similarities and the differences. I will end on the differences, but first let's look at the similarities. The first obvious one is they both use tiny electrical signals to send information between processors. They have converged on, on that model, and perhaps it's not surprising. You could not do uh, achieve intelligent behavior with, with say, sound or, or mechanical forces. But the other great thing that both systems use is learning. And in fact, in computers, we use machine learning, and we, it's completely inspired from, from biology and from biological learning. And machine learning has been one of the greatest success stories of computer science over the last 30 years. It's everywhere today. You use it uh, daily in your, in your cell phones. So billions of people are, are benefiting and using uh, machine learning every day. The cutting edge of machine learning today is called deep learning. So let me tell you what deep learning is. It's an old idea that goes back to the 50s or the 80s where you're using uh, simple neural network models where you have networks of uh, sim simple processing units which are connected by edges that have weights and when you change the weights of course you change the input output uh, function of such a network and the idea is given data you're going to trick the weights to try to find the function in this network that is the closest to the one you're trying to approximate and this of course can be done by, by gradient descent and, and this is uh, called back propagation in this field, and this is what, what we're doing. So this was developed in the 80s, and what has changed today is that we have very large training set, big data, and we have GPUs and other clusters that can be used to train these very large networks. And this is an example, and, and the networks have gotten more complicated with many layers. This is why they are called deep architectures, or deep learning, for instance, in a computer vision application, you will typically have a stack, a network like this, with a stack of several levels, where, as you can imagine, the lower levels are learning to detect features in the image, for instance, edges, which is exactly what the visual cortex is doing, or other uh, local features, and, and then combine them progressively as you go up in the architecture to get more abstract uh, representations of the data, all the way up to the level where, where you may recognize whether there was, let's say, a cat or a tree in the image or not. Suffice it to say that in the past two years, these deep learning methods have shattered the benchmarks, uh, the, uh, the records uh, on all the benchmark data sets in all kinds of problems, engineering problems, in computer vision, speech recognition, automated translation between languages, robotics, etc. So what I propose is to apply deep learning to the natural sciences. I don't want to compete with Google, Microsoft, they have hundreds of machine learning PhDs. But I think UCI is extremely well positioned to apply these techniques to the natural sciences, both because of our strength in natural sciences and the strength that we have in, in, in machine learning. Um, I will give you three examples of application. My group has been working for quite a time, a bit of time. In, uh, at least for some of them, in, in physics and chemistry and biology, but I really want to convey the idea that these are very general methods. You could apply them in astrophysics, in geophysics, earth sciences, etc. Pork has been working on, 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 the, on the climate and earth sciences using other kinds of machine learning. And uh, the, the reason why we can achieve such breadth is really that the techniques are the same. In fact, if you look at the engineering applications, the same teams that have uh, been very successful in, in machine vision have also been very successful in speech recognition. So I think in collaboration with people from, from the application areas, it is possible for our teams to, to achieve important breakthroughs in these areas. So let me go to the first example, and I take it from physics. High energy physics. Uh, this is Andrew Langford here, who is a professor in the Department of Physics. We used to be in the administration of the Atlas Consortium, and now is an advisor to the White House in high energy physics. But what we're interested really is in this machine, which is a collider. 
Colliders are billion dollar instruments that are used to accelerate particles, protons in particular, at very high velocities, close to the speed of light, and smash them together. By doing so, you get a shower of derived particles. You have very large numbers of detectors around the collision area that are collecting the data. And this instrument here can produce a petabyte of data per second. So it's completely off the chart that, that Porek was showing you in the, in the uh, first uh, presentation. So this is really uh, big data. And by the way, most of you are scientists. You may have a grudge with some reviewers. So I've drawn here, here's one reviewer completely insignificant com compared to this liar. Um, what you want to do when you get this data is, for instance, to detect whether there was a Higgs boson that was produced dur during the collision or some other exotic particles. There are myriads of exotic particles that physicists are interested in, and you would like to know whether uh, they exist or they existed in the first, say, 10 to the min minus 15 seconds after the Big Bang. So this is really like recreating the Big Bang and trying to understand the fundamental nature of, of matter and the universe of, of, um, re regarding particles and regarding theories of the universe. For instance, can you unify uh, gravity with the other forces, et cetera, et cetera. But once you get the data, it's really a statistical problem of detection of, of, of uh, particular signals in this, in this very noisy data. And so in collaboration with uh, Daniel Whiteson, who is going to talk to you later today, we have uh, applied uh, deep learning methods, for instance, to the problem of detecting Higgs boson. We're working on the different modes of decay of Higgs boson now. And we have shown in this uh, recent publication in, in Nature Communications that it is possible, using deep learning, to improve the, our ability to detect these exotic particles in this noisy data by a very significant amount, something like 8 to 10 percent, which, which is really a, a, a amount. And uh, the Large Hadron Collider is gearing up to do a new series of experiments in 2015, and so ideally we would like to be ready with clusters of GPUs to be able to, to analyze this data. Let me move to an application in chemistry. You all have seen these large textbooks that our undergraduate or graduate students have to uh, memorize. What we would like to do really is to capture uh, this, all this information in, in a very compact way. This is what machine learning is about. It's compressing, it's extracting models from, from, from large amounts of data. So how can you build an expert system? And today there is no such expert system, let me tell you, that understand uh, chemical reactivity, for instance at the level of, of human experts, chemistry professors, or even beyond. Obviously, such a system would have a lot of applications, whether it's in the design of new molecules, in, in pharmacology, in, in material science, et cetera, et cetera. So you can approach this problem of building an expert system in different ways, and there is at least two different ways. One is, would be to write down rules. And the other one is to try to use machine learning. So if you write rules, this is exactly what we did with uh, Jonathan Shen, a student uh, of mine a few years ago. He's at Stanford now. And uh, he wrote a system called Reaction Explorer that has 1,800 rules that pretty much covers the undergraduate curriculum of, uh, of uh, organic chemistry. And there is a language for writing these rules. I won't go into details. It's called SMERS. And uh, this system was actually quite successful. It was um, used to develop an interactive system that helps students to learn about chemical reactions. We uh, uh, spinned off a company called Reaction Explorer. Uh, with UCI and finally, we were able to license the system exclusively to, to Wiley, and Wiley is distributing it uh, uh, worldwide, uh, providing some royalty stream for the, for the UC regions. But, there is a problem when you do that, and the problem is that it's very tedious. You have to write these rules by hand. That's the first thing. And it doesn't scale well up, because every time you add a rule, there is a danger that it may break up all the previous rules. So you have to check for all kinds of inconsistencies with the previous rule. And the coverage is limited. In this case, we can only cover undergraduate organic chemistry, and, and uh, most of it, but not, not everything. So the question is, how can we go beyond this and try to build an expert system for chemical reactions? 
Well, if you, if you talk to chemists and you look at how they think about chemical reactions, it's actually relatively simple. This is a very simple reaction, the bromination of an alkene. An alkene is a molecule with a double bond. And this is the, if you write the rule, you get this type of equation. But really, the chemists think in terms of elementary reactions which correspond to small movements of electrons from sources, regions that are in the molecules, in the reactants that are rich with electrons, towards the sinks. So for instance, in this case, you first have the HBr, which breaks down into H plus Br minus, and then the Br minus is able to attach the double bond here and attach to this alkene. So it's really a two-step uh, reaction when you look at it in this way. And basically what you have to do is you take your reactants, you find all the sources of electron, potential sources, all the potential sinks, and this is just, you, write, you can write a bunch of rules, known rules for doing that. And so you now may end up with having uh, 10 sources and 10 sinks in your reactants, and you have, you can combine them in all possible ways, you get 100 possible elementary reactions. Which one is the more, more likely to occur? Well, it's a ranking problem. That's exactly what Google is doing when you're entering a query, you get a, a, a list of, of results and they are ranked. So that's definitely a problem for machine learning. And if you get data to do this, uh, this you can train a deep learning architecture to rank the reaction. So that's exactly uh, what we did. And we're continuing to improve the system, but there is good evidence that the system is, is uh, right now at the level at least of a graduate student in, in chemistry, and hopefully with more data and, and more complex architectures, one day we should be able to reach uh, human level performance. So this is just a schematic of the process. Here are your molecules. You find the electron sources and the sink. Since there is some filtering that can also be done using machine learning methods. And then finally the ranking of the elementary reactions, which you can then also chain, of course, to find what is the global reaction that is uh, occurring there. Let me switch to an example in biology, uh, mining omic data, in this case uh, structural proteomic data from the PDB database, prediction of uh, protein structures, a very fundamental uh, unsolved problem. The way we approach the problem is we start from the protein sequence, we predict a number of features, in particular the, in particular the, the secondary structure, the, location of the alpha indices and the strands along the protein backbone. We then predict the contact map, which is just a, a matrix, if you want, of zero and one, where you put a one, it's symmetric and very sparse. You put a one at position i and j if the corresponding amino acids are close together in the three-dimensional structure. And then from the contact map, you try to derive the x, y, z coordinates of all the atoms in the, in the protein. Well, the good news is that, again, using deep learning, the first step is essentially solved. We just published a paper that we can, uh, showing that you can predict secondary structure with about 95% accuracy, and there is no, not, room, not much room to go uh, above that because the, the data is noisy anyway. So the first step is solved. The third step is also solved. If you have a good contact map, there are techniques for recovering uh, uh, the coordinates of the backbone and then of the side chains. So the real problem, the hard problem, is the prediction of the contact map, or the prediction of this uh, symmetric uh, sparse matrix. And there, of course, you can try to apply uh, deep learning methods. That, that's uh, what we did. The, the data, the, the PDB database contains about 100,000 structure. It's, it's not that large compared to other problems, but it's, it's growing. And you can start at least applying these techniques. And to make a long story short, at the last uh, CAS uh, experiment, this is an experiment that takes place every, every two years, CAS 10, where people are comparing different predictors. In the contact map category, the first two entries were uh, deep learning from uh, previous students of mine and current students. So these are three examples from physics, from chemistry, from biology, where I hope I've given you a sense that deep learning can, can, can be extremely useful, and, and there are many, many more uh, such examples. I am very excited by the prospects for mining uh, other types of booming data that I, I don't have uh, time uh, going to, 
but in particular uh, data about the brain, not only because it's the decade of the brain, but because machine learning is inspired by the brain. So it's extremely interesting for us to go back to the original source of inspiration. This is a paper uh, written with, in collaboration with Marcelo Wood in here in the School of Biological Sciences uh, on the discovering a new protein that plays a particular important role in, 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 in memory. The question that is behind all this, and it is of great interest, of course, is how does the brain store bits at the level of, of synapses, for instance. So in closing, let me go back to the comparison between brains and machine and tell you something about the differences. I told you about the similarities learning, but they are very different. And if you look at energy consumption, the brain spends something like uh, 20 to 40 watts, and the IBM supercomputer consumes about 85,000 watts, so four orders of magnitude more. The brain is extremely efficient, and there are many reasons for that, but one of the key reasons is the architecture. The computers we use, they have a very peculiar architecture where you have storage on one side and computing on the other side, and you have to somehow send information between these two um, entities. In the brain, as far as we can tell, there is no separation. The computing and the storage are completely interwined. It's a completely different model of computing. And deep learning is very important to us, not only because it allows us to understand data, but it allows us to think about completely different ways of computing, where storage, uh, store memory, and, and computing are intimately interwined. Thank you. Thanks, Pierre. Uh, time for a quick question or two from the audience. I'll ask Pierre. Oh, we have one over here. All right. So the um, in the. Um, um, biology example that you showed, you, you showed that uh, the remaining problem had to do with the uh, prediction of contact mapping, and I was curious how much work uh, has started and, uh, and where are you in this area? Well, we have been predicting contact map for the last uh, 15 years, so there is, there is progress but we are still very far from being able to, to predict contact maps accurate, uh, accurately. What's, so, the main, what's the main problem there? Is it computational? Well, uh, to me, the main problem is the data. The, the training set are not large enough, so I think that that's the bottleneck, but, but there is room for, for improving the architectures, the algorithm, etc. What is difficult in the problem is to predict this corner of the matrix, which corresponds to long-range contacts. So these are amino acids that are far away along the protein sequence, but they end up close to each other in, in 3D. But this is general to, you know, if you do speech, that's, you have the same problem in speech or in natural language understanding. You have long, sparse, long-range correlations which are difficult to handle. Sometimes to understand a sentence, you need to get to the end to understand the beginning. It doesn't happen often, but when it happens, it's, it's essential. And that's where the complexity is. <coughs> right. Thanks again, Pierre.